Okay, so good morning. Uh, welcome to this course, ME five five three zero Introduction to Atmospheric Science. So this, I introduced this course in the year two thousand eight because I have been working in this area for last twelve years or so, and uh, we wanted to give a general introduction to this subject uh, to all branches, right? So it is basically a three credit course, uh, three lectures, no tutorial, no. Uh, practical and three credits, th three meetings per week. But of course, I will uh, we will solve a lot of problems during this course. So, the lectures will be interspersed with problems. Okay. So, all the quizzes and exams will be open notes, not open book, open your notes without photocopying. Okay. So, your notes and there is no tension, there is no need to memorize formula and all that. And uh, questions like with the need sketch, you explain all this will not come in the exam. So basically, you have to crack problems. Right? So, it is a typical uh, math oriented course. right? Uh, I have given you the course content. Let us quickly go through this. The first few lectures, we look at introduction, where we look at the various components of the climate system. Here, we look not only at the atmosphere, we look at the oceans. Okay? Why do you think the oceans are very important in the climate system of the earth? There is a big heat sink. right? The mass of the ocean is so much, the mass into specific heat is so much that they can act as a thermal reservoir. Okay? So, they will and therefore, their response to any thermal disturbance will be accentuated or will be slowed down because of the high mass into specific heat of the oceans. So, they are like a thermal buffer. Okay? So, they are an important, uh, uh, oceans are an important actor in this whole drama of the climate and we are not going to study more about oceans because it is not an ocean engineering, it is not an OE course. But we will have to we will have to look at it for 2 3 hours. Uh, so, that will be the first all this we will consider in the first chapter. Then the cryosphere, the cryosphere is that part of the earth system where everything is in the form of ice. Right? So, Antarctic ice, Arctic ice and then subsurface ice and so on. Terrestrial biosphere, vegetation and all this. Vegetation also controls evaporation, transpiration, temperature control. For example, if you get into our campus there is a distinct difference from Sardar Patel road you get in there is a 2 degree drop right it is much better right because of the vegetation right so we look at this then the earth's crust and mantle the earth's crust and mantle are also important so plate tectonics continental drift and all that there are many issues involved with that but these we will be able to look at we will be looking at them uh, as a overview kind of thing because the course is not on uh, the earth system Right? It is not a geology course, it is an atmospheric science, but this is an important aspect. So, that will be covered in the first chapter. Role of all these various components in the climate. Hydrological cycle is the, you have studied from basic geography. So, evaporation, then this thing, convection, rainfall, uh, then uh, glaciers melting, uh, rivers flowing down and all this. Then the carbon cycle is very important. And then we will also look at the brief history of the earth's climate and the earth system. For example, the ice age and all this and then what about the changes in the solar radiation, how they affect the climate and all that and why the earth's temperature is increasing now, the average earth temperature is, uh, is climate change real or is climate change is a very knee jerk response, uh, is, a, is it scientific, all those issues we will look at it. We will look at them from a, we will try to put the whole thing down as a simple first order equation and okay, or a zero order equation and try to find out, okay, we will take a. a inertia or time constant of the system, we will see how long it will take for the earth to respond based on various what we call as forcings, that is various forcing vectors. These forcing vectors may be increase in carbon dioxide, forcing this may be increase in carbon dioxide and this and many other things like that. Okay? And after going through the introduction, we will spend a considerable time on this atmospheric thermodynamics. This is a very important part of the course, where we start from the basic ME1100 which all of you have undergone, all of you have taken this course that is thermodynamics, other colleges also they would have studied this thermodynamics. We will start with gas loss, hydrostatic equation, then we will look at the first law of thermodynamics applicable to an atmosphere, then the adiabatic process is a big deal. Okay? Adiabatic process that is where there is no heat transfer, adiabatic process is a big deal in the atmosphere and uh, what is the difference if already thermodynamics is known to you, what is a big deal? What is a big deal in studying thermodynamics again in this course? So, what is special in atmospheric thermodynamics? Feel free. That is okay, but look beyond. We are interested in thermodynamics of dry air or moist air? 
moisture. Ah. If you are always entering thermodynamics of moist air, there you took a cylinder and piston, it is always drier. P is equal to rho RT, you, did, you didn't worry much about the moisture content and all this, except in one course, if you are mechanical students, refrigeration air conditioning, where you looked at psychrometric chart, right, where you looked at dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature and otherwise we have never studied moisture air thermodynamics. But moisture air thermodynamics is very important. Why moisture air thermodynamics is important? Because let us take an air parcel, it is going up. After some time, it will reach a temperature at which water will become ice, okay. At that time, there is a chance that it can fall as rain or it can be a super saturated liquid, okay. So, there is something called lifting condensation level. There are various terminologies which you have to understand, right. How this rising air parcel finally becomes uh, precipitate, uh, sheds its moisture as precipitation and so on. All these atmospheric processes we will consider. Second law on entropy and we will also look at atmospheric dispersion, okay. Atmospheric dispersion is basically uh, winds are carrying these aerosols and other things, okay, dust. For example, there is something called the Asian brown cloud. They are saying that we are uh, pumping lot of uh, gases from our power plants and all this. This is causing a Asian brown cloud over the whole this thing. And if somebody is seeing from the top using a satellite, every, everything it is brown and they are saying that India is the culprit and all that. But other people have already grown. We also have to grow, right? So, right, and uh, we, our growth cannot be stopped. Stop just just because already others have achieved the growth. But these are our, these are geopolitical consequences. So let us not go into that. This, these are all policy issues. Okay. Then radiative transfer of the atmosphere. We look at the electromagnetic spectrum, radiation loss. Then physics of absorption, emission, and scattering. This is very important. Okay, because the climate of the Earth is controlled by the radiation balance. The weather is mostly, the weather is mostly controlled by winds and other things, right. The climate, the climate uh, is governed by the radiation balance. Now you have to understand the difference between weather and climate. Weather is basically maximum up to one or two weeks. Climate is a long term, you are looking at long term changes. So if you have to, so the frequently they will say, uh, why are you talking uh, big about uh, supercomputers, atmospheric science and modeling and all that? You can't even predict tomorrow's weather. How can you predict the earth's climate after 30 years? This is a genuine question many people ask, right? You don't even, tomorrow you say it rains, it does not rain. You can't even predict tomorrow. Then uh, why are you scaring us that after 30 years this will be like that, that will be all glaciers will melt? What do you think will be an appropriate response to that question or that criticism? Climate is an average quantity and climate is a mathematically prediction of climate is a boundary value problem where the boundaries we know the conditions exactly. The prediction of weather is an initial value problem in maths. So it strongly depends on your initial condition. Suppose I have to forecast the weather tomorrow morning 8 o'clock in Chennai, I will use the present conditions as initial conditions and then I will solve some nonlinear governing equation. These are the laws of conservation of mass, momentum, energy or Navier-Stokes equation, equation of energy, uh, equation of continuity and so on. But if I have a problem with my initial conditions, as you know, nonlinear dynamics problem, if there are errors in the initial condition, the errors will propagate with time. So if I predict for 24 hours, if I get some error, if I predict for 48 hours, I will get even more error. If I predict for 72 hours, even more error. If I predict for one week, it will be totally so what I predict will be completely, completely different from the truth. But climate is lot easier to predict because it is average and climate is a boundary value problem, right. Because the solar, suppose you, you are calculating the earth's average temperature based on the solar radiation, solar constant, which is 1353 watts per meter square for example. Amount of radiation per meter square falling on the earth, it is not going to change from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, it will change. But it is time constant is so high, it is not going to change tomorrow or July or August or September. So it is, it is easier to track that problem. Therefore, when scientifically we study climate change, we are able to predict scenarios, our confidence level is much more than the confidence level which we have in predicting ev weather events in 72 hours or 96 hours. So regardless of our ability or the absence of ability to accurately predict weather, we have, we have we we have to we have to give it, we have to give it we have to give it to the community the atmospheric and climate modelers 
that it is possible to predict the earth's climate reasonably well okay so radiative trans in the atmosphere planetary radiation budget this is very very important so so many watts per meter square is entering how, how many watts per meter square are going out as reflection from the clouds reflection from the surface how many watts per meter square are going as evaporation transpiration so if you do this energy balance then we will work out quantities like how much is reflected that is called as a planetary albedo how much is reflected as a percentage of incoming so if you can work out a planetary albedo for mars jupiter this thing and all that and you can see whether the planetary albedo is changing and what is its influence on the earth's climate for example you can do calculations where if planetary albedo changes by 1% 2% 5% what will be its effect on the earth's average temperature in the 5 years 10 years 50 years whatever all right then this radiation is also important because radiation can be used to the radiation of the earth's surface can be used to uh, remotely measure several things for example if i keep a if i keep a sensor on the top of a satellite and this sensor is a microwave sensor the microwave sensor is capable the microwave is capable of penetrating clouds okay so if you look at the ocean from the top even if there are heavy clouds the signature or the output which you are seeing at the top of the atmosphere gives a lot of information about the cloud structure and the water and the water vapor and ice if any in the atmosphere therefore it is possible for you to write down the radiative transfer equations assume some distribution of moisture and water and ice in the atmosphere and solve the radiative transfer equation and actually calculate what will be the theoretically measured radiance or radiation at the top of the satellite but the satellite at that point is measuring something these two will not match therefore assuming that the measurement is correct i have to correct my assumption of the distribution of water ice and all that i will keep on correcting till i get very good agreement between measurements and simulation if they these two match then whatever i have got the profiles i have got are the correct profiles so this is basically a 2 minute course on remote sensing this can be done using the infrared part of the spectrum this can be done using the microwave part of the spectrum infrared cannot penetrate the clouds but infrared can give good information in partly cloudy situations and clear sky situations microwave can good good can give good information in rainy situations this remote sensing originally in the 70s when people launched satellite it was it was considered great to just look at pictures in the visible part of the spectrum if you put images in newspapers and media and all that it was considered a great achievement if you, i am able to see clouds from the top but what is the difficulty with the visible image just think it is two dimensional two dimensional is all right because all the things are two dimensional that is correct it is uh, that's a good point all are only 2d any simple just see one layer you just see one layer maybe the top third night time you can't see <laughs> night time you can't see infrared will give 24 hours but infrared it cannot penetrate the clouds so infrared also we'll see one top layer whatever is the top layer so we can get the temperature at the top layer if it is cloudy i can get the temperature at the topmost cloud then i can from the topmost cloud what can i do now if i know the temperature at the topmost cloud now you think huh? use a model what model just think 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 it is not so difficult okay it's too early i will uh, for you because you are not exposed to this assume that the surface of the earth is at 30 degrees okay you know there is called atmospheric lapse rate i'll discuss this in the later classes that means in how many degrees centigrade per kilometer it, the temperature will fall if it is known in that place from the infrared if you know the cloud top temperature that is the top of the cloud temperature you know the surface temperature you can actually work out the distance based on this distance you can find out whether it is a high cloud medium cloud or low cloud if it is a high cloud 
there is a chance that lot of moisture will be there and therefore it is a, there is a chance it will be a thunder cloud or cumulonimbus or heavily heavily convecting precipitating cloud if the top layer temperature is very high that means the cloud is very close to the earth then it may not rain so indirectly you can you can figure out so like this and there are other things like invisible part of the spectrum also you can look at the same you can look at for example the western ghats and last 10 years you can find out whether vegetation has increased or decreased you can spot forest fires okay so you can do lot of things with satellite technology okay to understand satellite technology and use it in remote sensing you have to you have to know, get your basics in atmospheric science right all right then atmospheric dynamics dynamics means how uh, thunderstorm evolves how does a tropical cyclone evolve a typhoon okay those kinds of things first you have to find out what are the governing equations what governs the dynamics of the atmosphere it is basically the fluid dynamic laws laws of conservation of mass momentum and energy then we'll briefly go through that there's something called geostrophic approximation and then cyclostrophic approximation where in this big navier stokes equation some inertia term some terms you can omit and then make it simple and lead it lead to an approximation wherein first cut you can get how many meters per second will be the wind speed and all that okay if you are a, uh, if you are very rich and if you have super computers you can you can solve the problem in its full strength but uh, sometimes why take a ak47 to kill a mosquito right so if it is required if it is required you will have to solve it on super computer otherwise can you do some intelligent back of the envelope calculations and approximately first order can you say whether it is 10 meters per second or 100 meters per second okay so we need to get our fundas right in atmospheric dynamics so this ambitious i don't know how much we can cover in this 40 or 42 hours but this at least what should be taught in an atmospheric introduction to atmospheric science course then atmospheric boundary layer you know that uh, there is a boundary layer but the boundary layer of the atmosphere any guess what will be the height of the boundary layer normal boundary layer what will be the thickness 10 mm 20 mm the atmospheric boundary layer is about 1 to 2 km okay so in that we will see we will it is kilometers right in that boundary layer we will have to look at various approximate formula which can be used in the dynamics then the last chapter is very important the climate dynamics or the climate science or climate change okay first you have to look at uh, what are the factors governing the present climate what is climate variability and uh, sensitivity and feedback that is what are the factors on which the climate is very sensitive to if we change these factors the climate will change okay so we look at finally of course we'll have to look at global warming global warming and then uh, climate monitoring and prediction all right so i've given this to you and i've also sent it as email to the people who have already registered right so at the end of the to, at the end of today's class i'll note down names of people who have just joined so the references are uh, it's a very good book uh, wallers and hobbs it is like the bible i don't know whether enough copies are there in the library so if you get one just uh, latch on to this any of these books very good book then the physics of atmosphere john howden is also very respected meteorologist introduction to atmospheric thermodynamics by sonis any book on atmospheric physics or thermodynamics we get it in the library just take it on long term introduction to dynamic meteorology where he looks at dynamics jr holton a climate modeling primer this will be the last two books will be for the last chapter okay then there's something called the ipcc right intergovernmental panel on climate change ipcc they gave this assessment reports about climate prediction climate uh, change and all that so this uh, 2007 climate change 2007 the physical science basis uh, book is also available i have one copy if somebody wants you just you can take it for one or two weeks and return it back to me so that your other friends can use so this climate change 2007 you can borrow it from me if you want all right so the classroom is basically studio 1 so tuesday 11 to 11:50 wednesday 10 to 10:50 thursday 8 to 8:50 friday 9 to 9:50 is the reserve okay don't give it to anybody else uh, because of travel and other things if you miss classes we have to make it, make up okay but i will give you at least 2 3 days notice i won't tell on a thursday that tomorrow please come all right generally it is 3 lecture meetings per uh, week so the grading policy for this course will be the first quiz will be 20 percent the second quiz will be 20 percent we'll, you will all present a term paper i'll divide into groups of 
two or three. I will we'll select some topics, I will give you some topics and you choose among one among this and then you will have to present, you will have to give a term paper and also give a presentation and everybody else will be there. So, we will uh, evaluate you and that will be for 15 percent and end semester will be 45, okay. All quizzes and end semester will be open notes, okay. okay. Now, let us get into this atmospheric science. I am using the PowerPoint basically today to cover ground uh, introductory material, material otherwise I have to write a lot. We will quickly switch to chalk and talk. So, that is my preferred mode and then please bring calculators to every class. Mostly we every class will be working out problems, all right. So, atmospheric science is a relatively new applied discipline. It is not as old as civil engineering or mechanical engineering or so on. So, atmospheric science courses might have started uh, maybe last 50, 60, 70 years. It is not even a century old, right. So, where for example, the Gindi Engineering College is 250 years old, you know, right across the civil engineering in Anna University is about 250 years old, okay. So, they, it is it's, right, it started as a survey school by the British, all right. So, what is atmospheric science? You can take down this if you want. Atmospheric science is concerned with the structure and evolutionary and evolution evolution of planetary atmosphere oh where is this delete ah. yeah yeah where we are concerned with the structure and evolution of planetary atmosphere and the phenomena associated with them okay so, you can do atmospheric science of Mars, Venus, Neptune, Pluto, whatever, but in this course we are looking at the atmosphere of the earth, okay. So, so that is interplanetary science, other planetary science that is beyond the, if you want to do that you have to go to some other place, we cannot do that in India. If you want to, if you want to research on the atmosphere of the Mars or Jupiter, you have to go to Oxford or Cambridge or some other school, all right. So, the main focus is usually on the earth's atmosphere and atmospheric science is also a subset of earth or geosciences. Earth science is a much broader term because the earth science will include several things, okay. Geology, geochemistry, geophysics, atmospheric science, ocean engineering, ocean sciences, atmosphere ocean coupling, all this, right. Why did the atmospheric science, why did atmo, uh, how did the atmospheric science develop? as a separate subject. The answer is already there. There was a requirement of reliable and accurate weather prediction. Maybe for cricket matches or something, I do not know or <laughs> agriculture production, monsoon, whatever, but that is Indian, but West I do not know why they wanted. So, but people wanted to know about the weather, okay. So, the demand started, the study started with the demand for a knowledge or need for reliable weather prediction. So, weather prediction has uh, hopefully evolved from an art into a science, okay. Uh, now, weather prediction is based heavily on mathematical models. It is not just based on some instruments and charts and it is not an extrapolation of the previous years this thing. Are you getting the point? There is one way of, for example, I will give you a another 2 minute course on statistical forecasting, okay. Now, let us say we want to, there is a cyclone which is formed in the Bay of Bengal, there is a satellite which is seeing this. So, the eye of the cyclone is the place in, at the center, the eye of the storm is the place of the lowest pressure where all the winds are converging, so right. So, th that from where you, you can, you have seen satellite pictures of vortices and all the vortex and all that. Now, let us say that every 6 hours or every 4 hours you are seeing the satellite picture. And then in 24 hours, you are actually recording okay, T so this is the position of the I at time T, T plus 6, T plus 12, then they are joined by straight line. 2 points and you will uh, do not pain me that sir, how you can join the best straight line, right. Otherwise, 2 points are enough to draw a straight line. Now, st 
statistical forecasting is if you have these points last 100 years you have looked at cyclones and uh, if you look at the average and then in 12 hours if something has gone like this then they will extrapolate this and say that t plus 18 t plus 24 it will be like that based on an ensemble average of already available data it is that is brute force statistics that is a statistical forecasting but suppose you have this you have this position you ingest this position and then let us say you take this domain on solve CFD equations on your supercomputer, then you are doing mathematical modeling and weather forecasting. Okay? So, this is a quick fix. This is a cross in for every fever. This is <laughs> this little more, there is some antibiotic, you find out what is this. But even then, here also, there are lots of approximations. Okay? And the whole idea of Suppose there is a there is a satellite overpass. Microwave satellite. So in this region, it is giving good information, right? On microwave. Suppose you incorporate this information into the model, then you are doing even better that is called assimilation. You assimilate or ingest or inject observations. Whenever you have, whenever you inject observations which are closer to truth or the truth itself, when you are into a mathematical model, generally it is, it is expected to improve things. Okay? So, weather forecasting has now evolved from an art into a science that relies on mathematical models based on conservation laws of mass, momentum and energy. It is a very important slide. This is from Wallace and Hobbes. The level of skill is, the level of skill is determined by how accurately you are able to predict an event. How will you measure, quantify this level of skill? This is usually done by something called not forecast, hind cast. Last 10 years, you look at all tropical cyclones. Use your models and predict. Actual truth will be there after the cyclone has crossed. So, this can be, your variable can be the quantity you are using may be where the cyclone hit the Indian coast. What is the error in the geographical location of the, okay? this is called landfall. That means, where it hits the land. So, you can take the error. So, in the kilometers. Okay? So, the, then if you see error in kilometer by this thing, that will be the percent, uh, that will be the skill. 100 percent skill will represent 0 error. Okay? So, you can see that the day 3 forecast, it can be for a precipitating system, monsoon or average climate or average weather, whatever. So, day 3 forecast has increased like this, day 5 has increased like this, day 7 has increased like this from the 80s to the data is up to 2007 or 8. Now, a couple of quick questions. Why do you think it is like this? Why is day 7 lower? Error propagates with time. Very good. Right? Now, northern hemisphere is more, southern hemisphere is less. With the, within day, day 3, day 5 and day uh, uh, Babu, where is, is there any, how, is there any pointer? Okay. Oh, mouse. Okay. So, this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. Now, tell me why is it like this? More landmass more land in, land in northern hemisphere. So, what? Huh? Do not tell me land, northern hemisphere is more advanced, that is correct actually. Huh? <laughs> northern hemisphere is more developed, that is okay. Because of that, they have more instruments, more measuring instruments and all that and uh, that is one thing. Secondly, more land mass in the northern hemisphere, so more weather stations. Data is deficient in the southern hemisphere. Okay? I will not talk about funda level and all that, that will again uh, this thing, we cannot have convergence on that. So, generally, but now that is also decreasing. 
right. So, once satellite technology is coming and high, high power mathematical modeling is coming, all these differences are going down, okay, right. I will send you this, if you can identify a class rep, I will send you this PDF to one of the persons, one student in the class, then who can just send it as a group mail to all the students, right. If any PowerPoint I am using, I will share it, all right. Weather forecasting, basically you want to know the future. Forecasting is very uh, intellectually stimulating, right. So, you, the, it gives you some intellectual drive and also uh, it, there is an absolute need from governments and economists and this thing policy makers. For example, India's gross domestic product is a strong function of how good this monsoon is. So, the government wants to be modelers and meteorologists to accurately predict beforehand so that they can take some emergency measures. A food corporation of India, you can store more grain, this thing, all this possible. We are not talking about geoengineering where we take planes and put silver iodide and create rain and all that. We do not know whether those solutions will work or not. But for preparedness in the case of a drought or in the case of a heavy rain, heavy monsoon, floods, loss of property, loss of life, in all these cases, so we want to, we want to be able to predict the future reasonably accurately. So to do that, you have to develop infrastructure. What is the infrastructure? which is required for weather forecasting, weather balloons, okay. The World Meteorological Organization had set a standard. There are two times, once in the morning and evening, the same time all over the world. The same time all over the world, all weather stations will launch balloons. This balloon will have instruments, which will measure the humidity, temperature and so on. There will be error. Because from Chennai, Meenambakam airport, you send the balloon, what is the problem? After some height, ah, it will drift, but it will not go to Malaysia or Singapore, right? So, <laughs> it will be a few hundred meters off, or, okay, depending upon the wind and all that. But so, so, it will reach some level and you will get those readings and these are sent to the ground stations, okay. And WMO ensures that all weather stations in the world share this information. So, this information is available, this basics, okay. Then radar, a radar is an active instrument where you send radiation and from the reflection you try to understand the situation, okay. Now, there is a, there is a radar on the marina, next time when you go you should see. It is on the Chennai Port Trust building opposite to the Reserve Bank of India on the Marina Road. If you see, there will be a white color spherical dome. You have seen on the Marina Beach, next time you see, that is the DWR, Doppler Weather Radar of Chennai, okay. So, it will open up and then it will scan, when it scans, okay. So, it will send some radiation from its place to the sky. Now, if no radiation comes back, what will be, what is the rain? No clouds, no rain, very simple. If there is heavy rain, it will get reflected. So, depending on the size of the raindrops and the thickness of this layer, so you will get a different signature of the reflected radiation. So, radar is, radar can also be used to hunt down aircrafts, this thing, missiles and all this. But for civilian, for weather application, this is very useful to, very useful for short term weather prediction called now casting. All commercial airplanes have this radar, okay. When they are going through turbulence, the pilot will get an idea whether he can pass through that or he, have to, he has to take a detour, okay. Radars, weather stations, okay. There is one weather station near the stadium, our stadium, IIT stadium, okay. That now we also have what is called AWS, automated weather station, where it will measure basic parameters like humidity, wind speed, temperature and so on and transmit this data to some server, okay. Aircraft measurements, okay. You can have, you can actually go, you can actually go uh, 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 in airplane and make measurements and actually you can, uh, you can actually open out and then take a sample, take a sample and measure all this uh, aerosol, this thing and all this. There are also hurricane hunters in the United States where they get into the storm, Indian Air Force we have not done so far, they get into the tornado or the storm and then they collect vital measurements. These are very important to improve our models because models assume then microphysics, models assume how, uh, 
how these uh, droplets are coalescing and right, how the rain starts and all these physical processes which are represented in those equations depend on these measurements. Of course, satellite meteorology, if you are studying weather through satellites, it is called satellite meteorology. So, this weather forecasting has led to lot of develop, development of infrastructure in all this. Apart from models, we use all this to study weather. So, in a, so if you look at a holistic picture of earth observation system, the weather, the weather observation system is very, very important component, but it is not the only component for the earth's climate monitoring system. Earth's climate monitoring system, you have to for many, many decades, you have to monitor the carbon dioxide concentration and you can also look at isotopes, okay. You can also look at isotopes or you can go down and get samples of ice. Carbon dioxide will be trapped in that, okay. Depending upon the height, you will, the height of the ice can be correlated with the time, okay. And then against this time, if you measure the carbon dioxide, you can see how carbon dioxide has changed with time. So, a lot of fundas are there. Then if you look at isotopes and you can go back to ice age and this thing, this study is called paleoclimatology. So, this is vast this thing, it is not just balloon and uh, satellite and that is weather system, earth observation system is much more, okay, much more detailed, right. So, what are these various uh, components of this? You can do climate monitoring, that is a part of the earth observation system. You can, ecologists are interested in studies on habitats, habitat of, uh, habitat of elephants in the Nilgiris. There is one Professor Sukumar from IIC Bangalore who is the whole life he is studying elephants. He is a professor of ecology, elephant habitat, how our human intervention, how they have been marginalized, why they are, why they are coming out and sometimes they come to the middle of the road also, right, okay. So, studies on habitats, ecosystems afforestation, deforestation, forest fires, how these things are linked to rainfall or droughts and so on, forest fires, right, forest fires and all these are part of the earth observation system. Atmospheric chemistry, now if you see I am just giving a broad overview, okay, the various, various facets of this science. Atmospheric chemistry is also important. You must have studied uh, in your uh, chemistry that acid rain Okay, we look at what this acid rain is. 50 years ago, the focus was only on urban air quality. We will say that uh, people are inter look, looking at respiratory diseases, okay. That was the only concern. Afterwards, in the 70s, the discovery of acid rain, the sulphur dioxide becoming sulfuric acid and the NOx, the nitrous, nitric or nitrous oxide becoming the nitric acid. This was a major milestone, it was an important thing, okay. These reactions you know. SO2 plus OH minus gives HOSO2, HOSO2 plus O2 gives this, HO2 plus SO3 and finally it becomes sulfuric acid. Then NO2 plus OH gives HNO3 nitric acid. So, acid rain can cause disturbance to regions located thousands of kilometers upwind because there is no visa required by clouds. They can form in Arabia and come to India, from India they can go to Singapore, anywhere no visa required, no flight, flight, flight ticket is required, they just move with the winds. Okay. So, therefore, acid, acid rain is an international problem. Okay. So, SO2, NO, NO2 and N2O dissolve in, why is acid rain formed? Because these gases, which are mostly released, okay, which are mostly released out of power plants and all this, they dissolve in very small cloud droplets to form weak solutions of sulfuric and nitric acid and then when they rain, along with the rain, they also come down as acid. Okay. Ozone destruction, all of you are aware of this. Another major discovery was that of the Antarctic ozone, ho ozone hole. The destruction of ozone which exposes the earth because ozone protects us from the harmful ultraviolet radiation, correct? From the sun was proved to be caused by chlorofluorocarbon and then they had an agreement and then CFCs were removed from all refrigerators. Now, we have got uh, CFC free refrigerators, right? R134A refrigerant is something which is new. Previously, they were using R12 and R22. After this, this is Montreal protocol, is it? I do not remember. Some Montreal protocol, they all agree, everybody agreed that we should have CFC free refrigerant. And the global warming, now it is making lot of noise, global warming caused by greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are uh, frequently referred to as GHG, greenhouse gases and globe, they cause the global warming. It is also another important issue affecting geochemistry. 
emergence of new fields. Climate dynamics is also an emerging field within the broad area of atmospheric science and availability of realistic data and evidence is the need of the hour, I think there is a problem. Uh, cores and computers, we require a lot of this, uh, have all contributed to climate modeling and climate change becoming availability of realistic data and uh, evidence. What is this? My assistant typed it, I have to fix it. Huh? Okay. Now, let us, uh, the last part of this lecture, uh, there are measurements of carbon dioxide continuously from 1958 by a person called Charles Keeling. Okay. And now, because uh, carbon dioxide is well dispersed in the atmosphere, it is proved that if you measure carbon dioxide at one place in the atmosphere, it is the same more or less anywhere in the earth. Therefore, a measurement at one place can serve as a proxy as a globally average carbon dioxide concentration. So, this place is in Hawaii called Mauna Loa. What does this say? So, this is from 1958. Okay. So, Mauna Loa and South Pole both are the same and uh, why is it fluctuating within that? Uh, there is a small fluctuation no, within a year. There is a, what is the reason for that? not weather, the seasons, photosynthesis and this thing, some in autumn there is no, uh, this right photosynthesis is less and all that. So, that causes the carbon dioxide within limits, but you can see the atmospheric concentration which was 310 parts per million ppm in 1958 is now 370. So, when you are actually doing weather models, radiative transfer modeling, now we have to use this 370. When, I, when you run the model after 10 years, you may use 400 or something. Okay. So, this is the variation of CO2 concentration with time. Okay. So, what? Okay, sir. Let it, let it increase. Generally, everything increases. Sir. <laughs> huh? So, what? Hmm. How can you say that? How can you prove that? Yes, the answer is here. The global increase of carbon dioxide is given by the red line. The mean global temperature of the earth, if you take the mean global temperature, you have some averaging procedure properly averaged that follows the blue line. The trouble is they are very strongly correlated, they follow a very similar trend. Therefore, there is enough reason to, there are enough reasons to believe that there is a strong correlation between the carbon dioxide and the global temperature increase and this carbon dioxide concentration now is much, much more than the last 2000 years and it is only in the last 100 years that we have invented the IC engine, the power plants, the aircraft, all of which use fossil fuels. Therefore, more fossil fuel burning has led to more carbon dioxide concentration, more carbon dioxide concentration has led to more absorption which we can prove from radiative transfer principles and this causes this so called greenhouse, greenhouse effect and therefore, this is a, the writing is on the wall, it is a clear message that we will have to somehow have carbon dioxide mitigating technologies, carbon dioxide sequestration, whatever you should have technologies which will limit the emission of carbon dioxide, battery cars, hybrid cars, whatever, right. So, photo, solar photovoltaic technology, where we, where we actually RG mechanical engineering, that is you bypass, you bypass the heat engine, okay. So, you do not burn a fossil fuel and try to do that, right. So, this is a very important, this is actually a very important uh, figure where we are able to correlate global temperature with carbon dioxide. Okay. Thank you. So, we will close. So, we will meet on Tuesday 11 o'clock. Any questions? The radiative transfer model which you are talking about, ah. which, uh, which, is, which is other proof that carbon dioxide actually uh, has an increase in temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, 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 I will be teaching. So, what is, so what I am saying is,
the carbon dioxide concentration I can put it in the radiative transfer model. In the radiative because of carbon dioxide it will increase some property like absorptivity or this thing emissivity whatever. Then we can show that with increase in uh, carbon dioxide this emissivity or absorption increases with increase in absorption this it will that we can prove. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Thank you.